Hey guys, welcome back to Smith Party of Six. I'm Adriana Smith, and today we're gonna continue our curriculum pick series. So if you haven't seen, I've already done the videos for our family curriculum picks, uh, my kindergartner and my second grader. So today we're gonna go ahead and move on to my fourth grader. So this year is technically Alexia's fourth grade year of school. If you've watched our previous curriculum picks videos, then you will have already seen that we're using Ambleside for most things. So we first started Ambleside last year. And when we did that, I kind of had to decide what years I wanted to put each of my kids into. So since Arwen was really just getting started with the more um, formal side of homeschooling, I just put her into year one. That made the most sense. It went right along with her age anyway. That was a great fit for her. Um, with my older two kids, I didn't want them to miss certain things in history. And so I put them in a year that's technically one below whatever their actual like grade level is. So for example, Alexia this year is doing year three of Ambleside, even though she's in fourth grade. So last year when we started, she was studying the medieval time period and I kind of really wanted her to get some of the stuff out of there. I thought that she would find a lot of it kind of interesting. Um, and so that's where I wanted her and I wanted Elijah in the Renaissance and Reformation time period. So even though he was in fourth grade last year, he was doing year three. She was in third grade last year, but she was doing year two. And in Ambleside, that's not really a big deal. If you have ever read through the books on the book list of Ambleside, then you will see why. It is not that they are behind by any means. I hate that term when it comes to homeschooling or just education in general anyways. Nobody is behind where they're supposed to be. We all learn at our own pace. But even in the sense that people often think of that, you know, being behind, they're not. Um, if they were in public school, they would learn much less than what they are in that ample side year for sure. So it's not anything like academic like that. It, I mainly based it off of where I wanted them to start in history and just kind of, um, seeing the levels of some of the books, especially for Elijah, I kind of wanted him to have a year in Ambleside before we started some of the books um, on their year four list, which we will get to in the next video, of course. So this video is about my fourth grader, Alexia, doing year three in Ambleside. So let's just go ahead and jump on in. First up, we'll go through our history category. So first up, we've got Island Story. Some of these books that I'm going to be talking about, I've already talked about in previous videos, so I'm going to try to not be long-winded about them. This gives the history of Britain, which I feel like for us in America is really important because technically, I mean, British history is also our history, you know, before a certain point. It's really interesting to get all of these stories. If you saw our um, review video from last year of like the books that they liked and didn't like, this wasn't the girl's like favorite book. They're not super into history all that much, but I personally love it, but that's mainly just because I've started to really love studying history. Next up is this country of ours. So this gives the history of this country of ours, the United States. It starts all the way back with the Vikings, goes through like the explorers like Columbus, up through the colonies, the revolution, all of that. Alexia is only at where this little, uh, post-it note is at right here in the book. So it's not like she's super far along in this. They focus on just like little bits per year. So this is one that's spread out over multiple years. This is one of my son's absolute favorite books. And Alexia is growing to like it. It's just, you know, fighting the whole history thing. And then our other history book is Still Child's History of the World. This is the one that if we have a really full week, I'm not gonna do whatever the required reading is in Child's History of the World. It's just not our favorite book, but I still think that it can be good, especially for reinforcing things that we've already learned in other books. So for example, we learn about Queen Elizabeth for a while in Island Story, and then we move on to someone else. But after we've moved on for a little while, we come back to Queen Elizabeth in A Child's History of the World. So it can be kind of a good reinforcement, like, oh yeah, we've heard about that before, and kind of making those connections. All right, so our next category is biography. So for all of the kids, um, they have Trial and Triumph as church history type of biography. Uh, so it starts in the early church shortly after the apostles 
and moves forward all the way throughout church history up until, ooh, Charles Spurgeon is in here, nice. Even some more recent ones it has in there. C.S. Lewis is in here. So yeah, it moves just all the way up through church history and kind of gives accounts of really important people to the history of the church and what their contribution was. It's really inspiring. There are some stories in here that are really hard, just hard to think about our Christian brothers and sisters having to go through. It does not shy away from the fact that you know, people have been martyred for the faith. So I know that some kids who are more sensitive might have a hard time with this book. I also mentioned in our previous video, I know that certain Roman Catholic families don't necessarily love this book because it is coming from a Protestant viewpoint. It doesn't always paint the Roman Catholic Church in a great light, but I think that it's good for all of us to read things on kind of both sides of history, just so that we can be informed about what both sides thought, what the viewpoint on both sides are. So we've got that. For term one biography, she is learning all about Leonardo da Vinci. This is the book Leonardo da Vinci by Emily Hahn. And last year when Elijah was doing it, we also found this cool little book that is called The Journal of Inventions of Leonardo da Vinci. And I'll link all of this stuff down in the description box. But um, so this one is a pop-up book that shows different inventions and things of his really cool and like a lot of his notes and things as well. So this is something that um, really kind of, I think helps to bring the other book to life because you read about certain things that he invented and then we can go find them in here um, and kind of be able to see a little bit better what it would have been like and what he was thinking of. He was really ahead of his time and it's been super interesting to learn about him. And I love that as the mom, I'm getting to read these things multiple times because there are things that I didn't pick up on even last year when I read it the first time that now I'm like, oh my goodness, I didn't realize that that was in there. I didn't know that he did that. So anyways, this has been an enjoyable book for us and uh, we're continuing with it this year. In term two, she'll be focusing on um, William Shakespeare. This is just like a little picture book. Like I just have them do a few pages a week usually in it and that gets us through it. We don't want them to finish, even if it's something like a picture book, we usually don't want them to finish it super quick. We want them to have time to kind of like chew on and digest the material mentally and spreading it out over multiple weeks instead of just having them sit down and read the whole thing in a sitting. I just really feel like it helps them kind of recall the material better because they have a longer time to sit with it. They're not just like rushing through and being bombarded with information that then is just going to seep out uh, the moment that they're done reading the book. So anyways, this one will be spread out over term two. And then for the final one for term three, we do Landing of the Pilgrims. Elijah liked this one a lot last year. And then over the summer, we were reading uh, a different book with some of our friends about the Mayflower and the Pilgrims. And so some of the names that were in that book, he was like, I know all about that person already. So it was fun to see the connections with that too. Um, so yeah, we like Landing of the Pilgrims. Next up, we have the geography category. So throughout the year for geography, um, she does have a couple of books that the, some of the other kids have too because it's spread out over multiple years, just like this country of ours and Island Story. Um, so the first one is Home Geography by CC Long. They'll just do maybe like six lessons from it a year, maybe even less than that. Nothing too crazy. In this book, they're mainly learning things. Here, let me go to the table of contents and I will just read them to you. Some of them at least. Position, how the sun shows direction, how the stars show direction, how the compass shows direction, questions on direction, what the winds bring, how to tell distance, pictures and plans. So that starts like the maps. Uh, a map making type of category. God made them all, plains, hills, mountains, valleys, rain, wind, snow, how water is changed to vapor, how vapors change to water. So just all kinds of different things about the geography of the earth as a whole and just geography as a study in general. Uh, and then we also have a similar book to that, which was actually written by Charlotte Mason herself called Elementary Geography that again, we just do like a few lessons from it per term, maybe even less than that, just kind of spread out throughout the term. And it has similar things to that. It talks about, you know, like hot and cold countries, why we have day and night, why a year is 365 days, just um, kind of basic stuff to get geography and how the world works set up in their minds. 
Um, so we have those two. But then uh, for year three specifically, we learn all about the adventures of Marco Polo. This is a really fun one. The language is super rich. When we first started, I know with Elijah, it was like, I only wanted to read like maybe five paragraphs at a time. But then as you kind of get into the flow of it, it makes things a lot easier. As I suggested, I think in the last video, it also helps if when you're reading something that has kind of more rich language, if you as the mom pre-read it, that will help you tremendously in kind of like understanding where things are going as you're reading. If I'm honest with you, I actually don't pre-read anything, uh, but it does help. Just even like I said, comparing last year to this year, it's obviously a lot easier for us to get through things because I feel like their comprehension is also a lot of times based on the way that we're reading something. So if you're already familiar with it, you know the way that it's talking, you know what types of things are coming next, then you kind of set that up with your voice and it makes it a lot easier for the kids to understand as well. So then with this book, we also have map work that we do. And I do that out of Map Trek. This one is the Atlas. And then this one has the outlines. And there are actually maps in here specifically for Marco Polo's travels. So I just went ahead and photocopied because you know I'm gonna wanna reuse this for at least two other children. Um, so I photocopied the map from in here. Let me actually go to that so that you can see. Here it is. So it's a map of the Mongol Empire, but then the line actually on there that is going with the arrows uh, that is the line for Marco Polo's adventures. So whenever we're reading about a certain place for the day, so for example, so far, we've only heard about Venice, which is where he was leaving from. So it, the first part of the book kind of sets up the story and everything. So we've only heard about Venice so far. So we found where Venice was on that line. She put a dot for it and wrote Venice. And then as we're going, we'll kind of follow his line there, put our dots where we need to in places that we hear about, and she can mark the name of those on there. So I use that as part of her map work. The other part, last year, actually for the past two years before this, the kids were working on the United States as a whole. This year we've focused in for the older two on West Virginia itself. So we have blank maps of West Virginia printed out one of them was actually in that map outlines book. So it has one for each of the states. And for that one, we marked just like important cities to us, places that we go a lot and kind of mark that down on there. And then I have other maps that show the county uh, divisions for West Virginia as well. And so then we've been working on that and them memorizing first the ones kind of where we go a lot. And then we're adding to that as the year goes on. And then they're getting quizzed on that usually once every two or three weeks. So that's something that independently, they'll kind of look over the map and where we've put the counties, kind of try to memorize it. So that then when we get to their map work quiz, they're ready and can write their counties on there. So that all goes with geography as well. So next up, we have natural history or science. And year three is the first year where they start doing experiments. So that is fun. For our um, experiment book, we have a drop of water. So she is learning all about the properties of water in this book. And she'll also later on learn about like the water cycle. And then in the back, it has different experiments that you can do. And the auxiliary uh, ladies for Ambleside have already set up the schedule to where, you know, you know what readings that you have to do per week. And they also put in the experiments that go with those readings as well for you so that you know exactly when you need to do one of the experiments from the back. And it's not anything crazy. They're very simple experiments, but it just helps to show what they're learning and reinforce it. Like we've been learning about surface tension. And so she did an experiment where she got to float um, a steel pen on the top of the water. And the experiment works not because uh, pins actually can float because if you break the surface tension, it does fall right down to the bottom. But just because the surface tension is holding it up as long as you do it very, very gently. So it's kind of nice that they get to kind of play with it, doing it just right to get that pin to float on there. And there's lots of just like different experiments like that throughout the year that they do from a drop of water. The readings are super short. It's very just a simple, basic introduction to things like this. Uh, so we really like that book. And then the other one, that they have is Pagu. So we love the story of Pagu. Honestly, we just love most of Holling Sea Holling's books in general. He's the same one who wrote Paddle to the Sea, Tree in the Trail, and Seabird. You will have heard me talk about those books in other videos that are 
finished already. He just really kind of brings things to life when he's talking about a topic. So Pagu is slightly longer than the books that Arwen is reading for year two. Each chapter, instead of just being like one page and a nice picture, it's three pages. So one, two, and three, then with a nice picture with it. So you get lots of information. There are little notes, just like always all around the border, little drawings and stuff that go with what he's talking about. Any topic that he is talking about, he just really brings it to life. So in Pagu, you're following the life of a hermit crab and it's called Pagu because the technical term for him is a Pagurus. So you follow him from when he is just teeny, teeny, tiny amongst the rest of the plankton all the way until he is an adult and has a little hermit crab family of his own. This is one of the ones that my kids get really attached to. All right, so next category is literature. So in year three, they are continuing some of the books that they've already started. For example, Parables from Nature. If you have watched the other videos, you know that this is one of my absolute favorites. I cry for many of them. They are absolutely beautiful. You will most definitely get more out of it as a mom than what they do as kids, but they get stuff out of it too. So I definitely recommend doing this one. We're also continuing with Tales from Shakespeare in this year, just continuing to familiarize ourselves with the plays of Shakespeare before actually diving into the full play itself. So I mentioned in another video, this one, it takes out any of the things that we might think of as being a little bit more risque and just tells the basics of the story, but in a very rich literature format. They always really enjoy these. Right now, the older two kids are reading Merchant of Venice out of this together. Arwen just finished up with Two Gentlemen of Verona. And uh, these are always stories that have them like chuckling the whole time or really feeling with the characters. So it's just a lot of fun. Last year, we were not able to finish A Pilgrim's Progress. It just, she wasn't quite ready for it yet at that point. So this year we're going through Pilgrim's Progress. Throughout the year, they'll also just randomly have some American tall tales. These are super fun. They tell the stories of those legends like Paul Bunyan, Picos Bill, Storm Along, uh, just all kinds of different American tall tales to kind of familiarize them with these stories. I usually have her do this as like an independent read separate from me whenever it um, comes up on the schedule for her. Then for this year, I also added to the schedule Little House on the Prairie for her. She has read Little House in the Big Woods and Farmer Boy already. And so this was just kind of the next step and she wanted to continue reading these with me. So that's what we are doing with that. So I should also take a minute to mention that um, on the Ambleside schedule itself, they also list the book, The Heroes for this year, which Elijah did read it last year when he was doing year three of Ambleside. However, I've decided to not do that this year. Um, it's not necessarily because we don't do the whole Greek mythology thing, because we will. We go ahead and we learn Greek mythology. Like this year, he is learning uh, Elijah is reading through Age of Fable, which is the Greek mythology for year four. With Greek mythology, I think it just all depends on how you as the parent frame it, just like anything else. For me, cattail. So for me, when we're reading the stories from Greek mythology, it's not because I want them to gain some uh, moral insight necessarily. Honestly, I almost use it more like an apologetics type of tool, like a, a defense of the Christian faith type of tool, because you look at these Greek and Roman gods and goddesses and you see that obviously they were created by humans. They are very flawed. They are very sinful. They can be wicked and very temperamental. And then you compare that to the God of scripture and see how much different the two are, what a contrast that there is. So we have a lot of actually really good in-depth conversations surrounding our time of reading Greek and Roman mythology. So it's not that I have anything against reading Greek and Roman mythology with them. I actually like doing that sort of thing because then I'm able to have those conversations with them and we use it kind of like a training ground. Honestly, the main reason was just that that book wasn't gonna fit into our days. And it was one of the ones that I had Elijah just read independently for the most part last year. And then he would come and narrate to me and we would talk about it. But this year I just didn't feel like that would be something that Alexia would be 
super interested in anyways. So we'll just wait until next year when she's reading Age of Fable. And then lastly for literature, um, each term there's a different book that they are reading. First term's book is The Princess and the Goblin. This was one of C.S. Lewis's favorite children's books. And so she is reading that independently on her own right now. In term two, it will be The Children of the New Forest, which ties in really, really nicely with their history book and it gives the flip side perspective of what the history book gives. So I like that so that they're already being able to kind of compare like, okay, well wait, in Island Story, we were kind of like on this person's side. And then in Children of the New Forest, we're kind of more on these people's side and we're kind of seeing the difference and um, being able to look through multiple points of view at something. So I really like this one. And then in term three, which I don't have a physical copy of right now, but I'll probably order one before term three rolls around. Uh, term three, they read The Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling. I was actually really upset because I just got a book of Rudyard Kipling's collected works from our local thrift store. They had like these beautiful old copies and I was hoping that maybe Jungle Book would be in there, but it's not. So I'll just have to purchase one online. So of course she also has poetry. So for year three, um, in term one, they're studying the poems of William Blake. We really like his stuff. In term two, they do Sarah Teasdale and Hilda Conkling, which Hilda Conkling is really interesting because she was a child when she wrote all of her poems. So that, you know, can kind of be a little inspirational for them as well. And then in term three, they are doing Jackson. Who is Jackson? Not Peter Jackson, that's Lord of the Rings. What Jackson are you? Helen Hunt Jackson, there we go. And then for term three, they are doing Helen Hunt Jackson's poetry. And you can actually purchase poetry books like that Ambleside has put together off of Amazon. I haven't done that yet, but I might start next year. For right now, we just go to the website every day and read their poem um, from there. I either do it from my phone or we usually have our laptop at the table too. So we just kind of pick and choose, but it would be nice to just have a hard copy of them as well. Okay, next category is math. So for this year, I chose for us to do the Charlotte Mason Elementary Arithmetic Series that um, is put out by Simply Charlotte Mason. We have had just a heck of a time finding math that actually fits. We used to like the old good and beautiful math before they switched. And then after the switch, it was just like kind of hopping from one thing to the next, trying to figure out, okay, what actually is going to work out as a long-term solution. So we have been doing school for a little over a month now. We've been back into our lessons. So um, we've been using this for a little over a month and I can easily say that this one is my favorite so far. It is very flexible. It is just a tool and I like that kind of stuff. I really like the math options where the math book itself kind of like gets out of the way and it's just a tool that you're using. So you as the mom are the one using the actual book. You don't hand this to the kids, it's for you. And then they're working with manipulatives, writing on slate. And then they also have like this gridded math notebook right here that they can write their equations and stuff in. Not all of them, but they'll write some of their equations. So I really just have enjoyed the way that this one is set up. It's the one that's made the most sense naturally for my brain so far. It's just very straightforward math not lots of extra thr frills, not lots of distracting pages to try to work through. It's very simple. Now, if you're one that likes your kids to do math without you, this would not be the option for you. Um, but I'm one that likes to do math with my kids anyways, so it works out perfectly for us. And with that also, so like I said, it comes with a slate. One side is gridded, the other is blank that they can work off of. There's a whole math box that it comes with that's like has a ruler, a clock, lots of different stuff to measure with. So, I mean, if you have lots of extras of this kind of stuff laying around, you wouldn't even have to buy the box. I ended up buying the box for the book three math, but not for the book one math that I bought. Um, and there's also a kitchen scale that it comes with. Basically, I just wasn't having to, I wasn't wanting to have to run back and forth constantly between the kitchen and the schoolroom to get what we needed. I just wanted it to be available. And so that was the easiest option for us. Everything that we need is included with that math box, which makes it really simple and I like that. So when my kids are around age nine or 10, I go ahead and start 
really focusing in on grammar with them. And for that, so far we have enjoyed using using language well and spelling wisdom from Simply Charlotte Mason. So for each day, I will actually just go to where Lexi left off. She'll be on lesson 23 next. So you open up the Using Language Well book, you have this little short lesson here, and I make copies of any of the stuff that I want them to actually write, or I just have them write it on lined paper so that I can, again, continue to pass this down. I don't wanna have to rebuy everything. So it will say to turn to exercise 23 in the spelling wisdom book and read the sentence. So we go there and it's called An Enemy's Rake from The Deer Slayer by James Fenimore Cooper. It says, who is there that doesn't get a scratch when an enemy holds the rake? And then it says that sentence is neither a statement nor a command because she's been learning about statements and commands for right now. It's a third type of sentence, a question. How can you identify a question sentence? What clues do you notice? And so after we've kind of talked about, first of all, we'll talk about the meaning of whatever she just read, then we'll do what it asks us to do. And then after that, it says to transcribe the question in your best handwriting, be sure to begin and end the sentence properly. And it gives you lines to do that here. I have them write it on lined paper so that we're not using this up. So it's just very basic. They're reading something, making observations about it to kind of learn about the structure of language, and then they are copying it themselves. Once it gets to a certain lesson number when you're about halfway through the book, it will have them stop transcribing. So when they transcribe, they are looking at a portion of it, kind of memorizing it, and then writing it down directly. They'll look back at another maybe few words, get it down, write it correctly. Um, so it's different than copy work because copy work, you can look at it the whole time. Transcribing, you're kind of like focusing in on a few things at a time. And then eventually it moves on to dictation. So they will study a whole section. I will actually flip to one of those near where Elijah is. For example, exercise 100 is from The Secret Garden and this is how big it is. So it's a whole little paragraph. I give him time. He can go away by himself in his room or wherever he wants to be. That's just like nice and quiet. And then he will look everything over, see the flow of the sentences, where capitalization and punctuation are, how they're working in there. And then he will come back to me whenever he's ready. I will have the book. I will say it to him and then he has to write it down without looking in between. So he has studied the whole exercise and then has to do it all. For handwriting, we pretty much always have used the good and the beautiful. We've done some stuff from Simply Charlotte Mason for handwriting. I honestly just prefer the stuff from the good and the beautiful for handwriting and so do the kids because it gives them other things to do in here besides just the handwriting bits, like different things that they can color and things like that too. So for example, here's a page that she um, hasn't done yet. So it has some print work that she's doing up here, but then she's also at the stage where she's learning cursive. And so that's happening here. And then down here it says, following the steps, draw the house in the blank box. And so it's just giving them something else to kind of do that's fun down at the end. So it'll always be like a drawing, coloring, or puzzle type of thing that they're doing um, at the end of each lesson. So on the days when she's not doing handwriting, then she's doing copy work. She'll pick something that she has read either that day or the day before that has really stood out to her from one of the books that we are reading. And then we have a specific copy work notebook that she will write that into just so that Again, it's kind of like writing down that really good language, seeing how sentences are used, the structure of them, how people use their words, and kind of getting into the flow of writing that. And of course, during that, she is having to use her best handwriting as well, because that is part of the point of copy work also, is writing with your best handwriting. And so you're growing those muscles, you're using those handwriting skills as well. I don't know if I mentioned this in the last video or not, but for their foreign language. So Charlotte Mason talked about how when we are teaching our children a foreign language, we are doing that to help them be better neighbors to those who are near them. And so of course here in America, I always thought like, okay, then Spanish, that would be a good option because other than English, there's probably more Spanish speakers in the country than anyone else. And so I had started them on Spanish, but partway through last year, they started taking ASL classes. We 
We actually have friends in our group who are deaf. And so it was nice for them to be able to learn to communicate with them. And then it was kind of obvious like, this totally fulfills that need of being a good neighbor and being able to speak and communicate with those around you like this is perfect and so we're just continuing on with their asl classes and we're not worrying about anything like spanish um, for right now so when my kids are in usually about second or third grade i start having them do typing lessons and so lexi is actually finishing up this typing one book i know it has elijah's name on it that's originally who i had using this book but it's just kind of, you know, gonna keep getting passed down. She is still working through the typing one book. She has just a little bit of that left and then she can move on to typing two. And these are both from The Good and the Beautiful. The only thing is, um, I know some people for typing stuff, they like to have something on their computer, like it's a software that kind of tracks their typing and their speed and all of that. So this obviously is not that you're doing it from a book and I have had to remind her occasionally about her hand placement so that she's not starting to do kind of like the hunt and peck thing. Uh, so just kind of be mindful of that, I guess. And if it's something that you're wanting an online program, then this wouldn't be the one for you, but this has worked out well for us so far. Elijah knows how to type pretty well. Lex is learning how to type. So we are continuing with those. And then finally, and I say finally, I always feel like I leave something out of these videos that I'm like, I should have probably talked about that. Um, but the last thing that I'm at least remembering for today to talk about, when our kids hit kind of a certain age and maturity level, we go ahead and we start having uh, the talk about sexual reproduction and maturity, that sort of thing with them. And so the book series that I use for that is called The Talk. It's put out um, by Luke Gilkerson and his wife, I don't remember her name and it's not on the front of the book. But I actually heard one of their talks during um, a homeschool summit, which I also have a link for the homeschool summits that I can put down in the description box below. They're a wealth of information. I've heard so many good speakers that have encouraged me and changed the way that I thought about homeschooling over time. Uh, so I definitely recommend that you check them out. But I heard one of their talks during the homeschool summit and just the way that they spoke about sex and it not being something to be ashamed of, not being something to feel dirty about, which is something that I struggled with a lot when I was younger. And just the way that we present it to our kids and, um, not necessarily shying away from the conversation, even when they're little, but just having just small age appropriate talks with them whenever certain questions arise that they may have. And then eventually when they're ready, going ahead and starting on the book. And so I purchased those for my kids uh, a couple years ago and I started using them, I think last year. So Alexia is in the first one right now with me. I really love the way that the lessons are set up, which I will just go ahead and go to one of them so that I can show you. For example, lesson two is called Be Fruitful and Multiply. So everything is based off of scripture. So we have this opening thought where we kind of open up the conversation and what we're going to be going over together. Um, and then we have scripture that we read together. I explain things to her. This one also has videos that go along with it. Um, but it doesn't shy away from going ahead and showing the different anatomies, how things work, different talking points that I should go over with her, um, that sort of thing. I like this approach to it because it keeps everything very basic, very matter of fact. Um, it's not something that we need to feel uncomfortable uncomfortable about. This is just the nature of the way that God made things. This is how we reproduce. This is what happens during that. Um, and it's just very factual, open to the point, that sort of thing. There are some questions at the end to ask, and then it has a little prayer section. So we pray together at the end of each lesson. I love it. They're super God-centered, which was something that was really important for me because there's so much information out there today and I want to be the first one to give my children the information about reproduction and what sex is for and about marriage and about it all being to the glory of God and this beautiful and wonderful thing. And since it is such a wonderful thing that we need to shepherd that, that we need to protect it and that we need to steward it and that we need to do it in the way that God has set up for us to do it. So anyways, I just really enjoyed finding those books. So I thought that I would pass them along to you guys too, if any of you thought that that might be helpful for your family. 
So I actually forgot to mention when I was filming this, but for her drawing, we use the Good and the Beautiful Drawing Vintage Images. They have all kinds of other drawing resources on their site now too. Um, she is in the level three book and for the vintage image set, it goes up to level five. We usually do drawing a few times a week uh, as an independent type of activity. One of the things that they do on their own while I'm working with another child. I also forgot to talk about handicrafts for her. I'm so bad about remembering stuff like this. So we are using wild and free handicrafts like I mentioned in the video about Arwen. And when she is not doing one of the projects out of here, she has a sewing kit that she has started to do stitch practice with and she'll have different sewing projects throughout the year. All right, but that's all that I've got for you today and our fourth grade curriculum picks. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to drop them down in the description box. I try to answer any comments that I see down there. If you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Subscribe down below for more homeschool content and I'll catch you guys next time. Bye.